Well, good morning, Jubilee. What a great privilege it is for me to be able to see you this morning. It's been more than two years uh, since I've been at this church. Uh, and thank you for your kind invitation uh, to be with your church community again. A warm greeting also to those who are joining us online. Uh, I have been praying for your church and uh, have seen what God is doing in this church, uh, even during the pandemic. And for all of you here uh, today, uh, what a testimony uh, to the love you have for Jesus and the love you have for your community that you are here uh, worshiping. You know, as a pastor uh, of over two decades, I've often wondered how men and women who started out so passionate for Jesus desiring to live out Christ-centered, God-honoring lives in their community and generation, fizzle out and lose that fire. For so many, their cheers for Jesus turn into passive silence, and in some cases, bitterness, jadedness, and even anger. How can this happen? Some years back, uh, a book was written by Gene Smith titled, When the Cheering Stopped. It was the story of President Woodrow Wilson of America and events that led up and following World War I. When World War I was over, President Wilson was an international hero. There was a great spirit of optimism abroad and people actually believed that the last war had been fought and the world had been safe, made safe for democracy. On his first visit to Paris after the war, President Wilson was greeted by cheering mobs he was actually more popular than the French heroes and French leaders. The same thing was true in England and Italy and all throughout Europe. Wilson received cheers and cheers. But the cheering lasted about a year. Then it gradually began to stop as world leaders began to argue and President Wilson ran into opposition domestically in America. In the next election cycle, his party was defeated. And it was so this President Wilson, a man who barely a year or two had been heralded as the new world's Messiah, came to the end of his days a broken and defeated man. It is a sad story, but it is not altogether unfamiliar to us because when we read about what happened to Jesus, it was eerily similar. When Jesus entered into the public scene more than 2,000 years ago in the area by the Galilee, he was an overnight sensation. His messages cut to people's heart. He suggested that true inward righteousness was what was more important than the outward, showy, hypocritical acts of righteousness practiced by the Jewish leaders of that time. The miracles he did, which authenticated his message, showed his divinity and bolstered his claim that he was God's son, God himself. So popular was Jesus that when he would try to go to be by himself alone, the people still followed him, even to the waters as he got into the boat. Even though the religious leaders tried to discredit him from the Galilee all the way to Jerusalem, the people still came to hear Jesus speak, to see his miracles, and perhaps be healed if they had a sickness. On his final week on earth, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. And as we just read, the masses lined the streets as he came to town. Let me read again how the gospel writer described this event in Mark chapter 11, verses 7 to 11. There was great cheering for the Messiah. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. In fulfillment of biblical prophecy of the Old Testament, the Bible tells us the Son of God, God himself, entered into Jerusalem to cheers of many people in what is known as Palm Sunday, which is today. Leafy palm branches were spread before Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem to go to the temple and through the shouts of Hosanna. The shouts of Hosanna really means, save us now. The people were crying for salvation. Great crowds came to hear him preach. 
A wave of religious expectations swept the country, specifically the city of Jerusalem. But the cheering didn't last long. There came to a point when the tidal wave began to turn on Jesus. Oh, if you and I were in Jerusalem at that time, we may not have noticed it at first. Perhaps people still came to see him, but the old excitement was gone. And the crowds were not as large as they had been. His critics now began to publicly and openly attack him as his enemies grew more vocal as they realized they could manipulate the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and they were able to bribe someone in Jesus' inner circle, Judas, who somehow had also become jaded. This was something new, a new development. Perhaps people got busy with their lives and the responsibilities that they had and their thinking about Jesus began to change as they saw others were not as passionate about Jesus. If you were the only one here this morning, would you come back next week? Perhaps you came because you knew there'd be a crowd this morning. Perhaps you came because you knew your friend would be here. But what if you were the only one? What if you were the only family? Would you still come? And that is how hysteria happens, right? We see something, lots of people are there. The people gathered upon the streets of Jerusalem and there they were. They came and they also shouted Hosanna. They couldn't perhaps see Jesus, but they did what everyone else was doing. But now somehow the tide had turned. Fewer and fewer were proclaiming Hosanna. And so a lot of them petered away. So the enemies of Jesus, whom earlier had been afraid to speak out for the fear of the masses, the Bible tells us, they began to perceive that the fickle crowd was turning on Jesus. Soon the opposition led by the Pharisees began to snowball in their plans. When they discovered they could not discredit his moral character and authority, they began to take more desperate measures and brought in Pilate and Judas into their plans. Before it was soon over, a tidal wave welled that brought Jesus to his knees under the weight of a cross. Perhaps some of the same people who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, turned and they voted to release the criminal Barabbas. And so their shouts from Hosanna turned to crucify him. How did the people of Jerusalem that week so radically turn against him? How did the shouts of Hosanna on Sunday transform to shouts of crucify him on a Friday? We're not told in scripture why the crowds were so fickle. But if we look at the message of Jesus, the message that Jesus was speaking, we can begin to see some underlying, deeper root causes that would have caused this fickle crowd to change so quickly. Why did the cheering stop? I believe there are three truths that Jesus taught that people had a hard time swallowing and accepting, especially when the noise and the hysteria was gone. And these are three truths today in our generation, young and old, that we too have a hard time accepting and living out, which causes us to cheer less for Jesus, perhaps, to allow our passions for him to wane and diminish, especially in the culture and the world in which we live. Let's see what these truths are. I believe the first reason why people then and the people today stopped cheering for Jesus was that the message Jesus taught and advocated for was not only about my or own personal benefit. His message was about serving others. He taught, number one, if you're taking notes, notes that all people are worth live, loving. Jesus taught that all people are worth loving and by extension, worth saving. That all people deserve to experience God's love for him, for them. That's why in his earthly ministry, Jesus often hung out and associated, as you know, with the sinners, the tax collectors, and those who were considered undesirable. He made himself available to those on the fringe of society to show them that they were worth loving and they were worth saving. In fact, he told us, taught us this in Mark chapter 12, one chapter over in verses 29 to 31. Look with me as I read Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 31. Jesus answered them, 
The first of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You know, this teaching was so unique to people then and even today who pride themselves in spiritual elitism, thinking that we or some people are better than others, although we'd never admit that, never. But in our words and our actions, we do believe intrinsically because of our human nature that we are better than others. It is the thinking that some people are worth saving while others are not. Perhaps those who are wealthier, smarter, more eloquent, hold a distinguished position in society, or perhaps people more like us are worth loving and worth sharing the gospel message to in order to save them. You know, most of us don't have a problem with the first part of Jesus' command of loving God. It is the second part that is hard for us to swallow and to accept. To love everyone as we love ourselves. That's a tough message to swallow. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we're told that salvation is not by works so that no one can boast, meaning everyone has equal access to God. But then the implication is that all people need to hear the gospel. And we need to put in the same effort of letting all know the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ loves them. Do we have that same passion for all? Now, you may be sitting there online or in the pews and thinking, Pastor, I, we do love all people. I do love all people. Don't ever call me a racist. Don't call me someone who is elite. I do. I know that's the right answer. But do you and I really do that? Do you treat all people the same, especially if you are privileged to be in a higher society level? Do you show everyone equally the love of Christ? In our home, we have one house helper who has been with us by God's grace for more than a decade. She's almost part of the family. She is part of the family. She loves our children and she loves our family very much. However, there are times when she makes a mistake or she has a bad attitude that it crosses our minds that day to let her go, to not deal with her anymore. But then she's still with us more than 10 years. Why? Is she perfect? No. But then neither are we. Let me ask you a question. Do you get rid of your children if they speak up to you or speak against you one time? You'd have no children. If you have a child who answers back or doesn't listen to you or has a bad attitude, do you get rid of them? Do you pack their bags and say, get out of here? Of course not. Why? What's the difference? Because we love them. They are our children. They are part of our family. We may discipline them, but we forgive them. I look at my life. I've had bad days. There are days when I don't have the best of attitudes at home. I'm glad my family has not kicked me out or forsaken me. Now, listen, if I can be afforded a bad day every now and then, can we not extend the same love and grace to the house helpers or the people that we have oversight over? Just think about that. Just think about how we think and act in relation to others. Before you answer the question, do I love all people equally? Now you've got to remember that in that society, it was a hierarchy. It was a hierarchy. So when Jesus preached that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself, there were people who were turned off. Because in our generation today, you and I know, we like to hear messages that speak about the benefits of Christianity for me. What can God give me? How do I feel today? Do I feel blessed? Amen, if you say you're blessed, right? I mean, that's how it is in our modern-day Christianity. But when we begin to talk about others and their sufferings and the need for us to reach out to them, boy, that's a hard message to swallow. And that's why when 
the crowds began to thin out and Jesus continued the same message about loving God and then loving others. Perhaps the passion for Jesus began to waver, perhaps then, perhaps now. In a story that first appeared in Home Life magazine in 1976, written by Elizabeth Ballard, she writes about a teacher named Miss Thompson and her student, Teddy Stollard. She writes, I had not seen Teddy Stollard since he was my student in fifth grade 15 years ago. It was early in my career and I had been teaching only for two years. From the first day that he stepped into my classroom, I, I disliked Teddy. Teachers, although everyone knows differently, are not supposed to have favorites in a class, but also especially they're not to show dislike for a child, any child. Nevertheless, every year there was one or two children that one cannot help but become attached to because teachers are also human. But it is also human nature to not like certain students. Well, we can't show it. Human nature draws us to those who are bright, pretty, intelligent, whether they're 10 years old or 25 years old. But there's always one or two who the teacher simply can't relate to and get to. The teacher, Ms. Thompson, writes, I had thought myself quite capable of handling my personal feelings along that line until Teddy walked in my life. There wasn't our child that particularly didn't like that year, but Teddy was the most assuredly one I disliked. He was dirty, not just occasionally, but all the time. His hair hung low over his ears, and he actually had to hold it out of his eyes as he wrote papers in class. Also, he had a particular odor about him, which I couldn't really identify. His physical faults were many, and his intellect wasn't very good. By the end of the first week, I knew he was hopelessly behind the others. Not only was he behind, he was just plain slow. I began to withdraw from him immediately. I concentrated on my best students and let others follow along as best they could. Ashamed as I admit it, I took perverse pleasure in using my red pen. And every time I came to Teddy's paper, the cross marks, and there were many, were always a little larger and a little redder than necessary. Poor work, I would write with a flourish. Well, I did not actually ridicule the boy. My attitude was quite obvious to the class, for he quickly became the class outcast, the unloved, the unlovable. He knew I didn't like him, but he didn't know why, nor did I know then and now why I felt such intense dislike for him. All I knew was that he was a little boy no one cared about, and I made no effort on his behalf. As the school year progressed, Christmas holidays approach. Thompson writes, I knew that Teddy would never catch up in time to be promoted to the sixth grade level. He would be a repeater. To justify myself, I went to his folder from time to time. He had very low grades for the first four years, but no grade failure. How he made it, I didn't know. He just simply made it enough to go to the next level. I closed my mind to the personal remarks about his family life. On the last day before Christmas holiday, many of the children brought gifts to me, their fifth grade teacher. Teddy's gift wasn't the last one I picked up. In fact, it was in the middle of the pile. It was wrapped in a brown paper bag and it colored Christmas trees and red bells over it. It was stuck together with mask and tape for Miss Thompson from Teddy, it read. The group, the class was completely silent. And for the first time I felt conspicuous embarrassed because they all stood watching me unwrap the gift. As I removed the last bit of masking tape, two items fell on my desk. A gaudy rhinestone bracelet with several stones missing and a small bottle of dime store cologne, half empty. I could hear the snickers and the whispers and I wasn't sure I could look at Teddy. But then I said, isn't it lovely? Placing the bracelet on my wrist. Teddy, would you come and help me wear it? He smiled shyly as he fixed the clasp, and I held it to my wrist for all of them to admire. There were a few hesitant oohs and ahs, but as I dabbed the cologne behind my ear, all the little girls lined up for a dab behind their ears. As the children left with shouts of, see you next year and Merry Christmas, Teddy walked to my desk. When they all left, he walked up to me and clutched his gift and books to his chest. He said to me softly, you smell just like my mom. 
Her bracelet looks real pretty on you. I'm glad you like it. He left quickly. I locked the door, sat down behind my desk and wept. Resolving to make up to Teddy, what I deliberately deprived him of, a teacher who cared. I stayed every afternoon with Teddy from the end of Christmas holidays until the last day of school. Sometimes we worked together, sometimes he worked along while I drew lesson plans or graded papers. Slowly but surely, he caught up with the rest of the class. In fact, his final average was among the highest of the class, and although I knew he would be moving on out of state when the school was out, I was not worried for him. Teddy had reached a level that would stand him in good stead for the next year, no matter where he went. He had enjoyed a measure of success, and as we were taught in our teacher training courses, success builds success. I didn't hear from Teddy until seven years later, when his first letter appeared in my mailbox. Dear Ms. Thompson, I just wanted to let you know, the first to know, I'll be graduating second in my class next month. Yours very truly, Teddy Stollard. I sent him a card of congratulations, a small package of a pen and a pencil gift set. I wondered what he would do after graduation. Four years later, Teddy's second letter came. Dear Ms. Thompson, I want you to be the first to know I was just informed I'll be graduating first in my university class. University has not been easy, but I liked it a lot. It was a challenge. Yours very truly, Teddy Stollard. I sent him a good pair of sterling silver monogram cufflinks and a card. So proud of him I could burst. And now Teddy's third letter. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, medical doctor. How about that? I'm gonna be married in July the 27th to be exact. I wanted to ask if you would come and sit where my mom would sit if she were here. I have no family as dad died last year. You're very truly Teddy Stollard. Thompson writes, I wrote back, dear Ted, congratulations. You made it and you did it yourself. In spite of those like me and not because of us, this day has come for you. God bless you, I'll be at your wedding with bells on. I love this story because it shows what happens when we live out the truth that all people are worth loving. When Jesus taught in the Bible that all people are worth loving and saving, do you continue to cheer that message? Or do you silently walk out? Stories like that tug at our heartstring. And if I were to ask you at this moment, would you love all people as yourself, you'd all say yes, because that's the right answer. But sadly, the moment we walk out these doors or we turn off our cameras and we finish today's service, we go back to seeing ourselves as better than others because that's the message we want to hear. That's the message this generation teaches us. What's my comfort and what it is for me? No wonder the people then Stop shouting, Hosanna, save us. Just like in this generation today, so many wane in their passion for Jesus when we begin to really listen to what Jesus was advocating for. The second reason why the people then and the people now stopped cheering for Jesus was that the message Jesus really taught was about him, number two, dying. Jesus talked about the cross and dying. If you will strip away the trappings and get to the core message of Jesus before and after he walked into Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna, what do you get? You get the cross. You get the cross. Jesus' own words, Mark chapter 10, verses 33 to 34, just two chapters back. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. My friends, would you be passionate for men and women who you knew would soon die? Would you put in the effort to someone who is going to leave this earth? Would you talk about someone whose life's highlight was dying on a cross? If so many people and his followers then, and even today, 
did not want to hear about Jesus going to the cross. They certainly didn't want to put their trust in someone who was going to die. You know, the people came and listened to him. The crowds grew because they wanted to make him king. They were looking through their own personal worldly lenses because they saw benefit in the coming kingdom that Jesus promised. They could not accept the fact that Jesus would have to go to the cross. In their minds, Jesus was going to overthrow their hated Roman oppressors. He would usher in the messianic kingdom. And early followers of Jesus, if you got into the crowd early enough, for sure you'd be given a high governmental of, uh, uh, office or position when Jesus set up his kingdom. Remember the sons of Zebedee? James and John, they were angling for a position in the future messianic kingdom. And they used taupo, they used a, a backhanded method. What did they use? They used their mother to ask Jesus, make sure my kids get a high position. The other disciples didn't like that. Imagine using your mother. But that's what they did. They were all angling up for a position. It was about position, fame, prestige, fortune, worldly blessings. If you associate with Jesus, then you would get those things. Sounds familiar today with the prosperity gospel, folks? Come to Jesus, all your problem goes away. Trust Jesus, your life will be full of blessings. But then we read the Bible as you and I should read the Bible. What was the message? It was about his death, him dying us dying to ourselves, all the way to the epistles. And then many of us say, never mind. I don't like this message. I don't like this message. Judas most likely turned on Jesus that week because Jesus moved from talking about the kingdom of God to talking about the cross and dying when the religious leaders rejected his offer of the kingdom and they said that his power was not from the one true God, it was from Beelzebub the devil himself. The gospel writer Matthew writes in chapter 16 of verse 21, from that time, that time the re leaders rejected him, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Perhaps the people in Jerusalem had not heard the message of Jesus that he had been slowly clearly, deliberately telling, I must die, but I will rise again. Oh, but then they began to hear as Jesus entered Jerusalem. And they didn't like that message because the message they wanted was about the overthrow of a government they didn't like and a kingdom of which they get to be a part of and receive many blessings. You know, culturally, if we lived back then, they would be shocked if they saw the cross being worn as jewelry today. I'm sure today, this morning, some of you may have your cross pendant or your cross earrings. They would be shocked because back then the cross was a symbol of death. No one would wear a symbol of death. That's morbid. It was one of the cruelest ways to die, as you know that. It was a path which Jesus chose. As Billy Graham notes in his sermon, The Offense of the Cross, he writes this. When Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up a cross. It was the same as saying, come and bring your electric chair with you. Take up the gas chamber and follow me. He didn't have a beautiful gold cross in mind. A cross on a church steeple or in the front of your Bible. Jesus had in mind a place of execution. And that is something we need to understand in our own lives. We need to embrace the cross for what it is. But in today's world, today's Christian thinking, there's a new philosophy of the Christian life that is redefining the cross, perhaps a new cross, a new cross that does not convict the sinner. It simply redirects him. It gears him to a more moralistic, cleaner, and a jollier way of living and saves his self-respect. The Christian message is slanted in the direction of the current trends and thinking in order, note this, to make it more acceptable to the public. But it misses the entire meaning of the cross. 
Today, sadly, in our generation, the cross is no longer an offense. But Galatians chapter 5 is very clear. The cross is an offense. It's going to offend people. The true cross message is not a popular message. It's about dying. It's about dying to self. The old cross is a symbol of death. It stands for the abrupt, a violent end of a human being. A man in Roman times who took a cross and started down that road had already said goodbye to his friends and family. He was not coming back. He was not going out to have his life redirected, made jollier. He was going to have his own life ended. My friends, the cross made no compromise, modified nothing, spared nothing. It slew all man completely and for good. It did not try to keep on good terms with the victim. It struck cruel and hard. And when it finished its work, the man was no more. They died to self so that in the Christ Easter message, they would be raised new in Christ. No wonder the passion of Jesus goes away because we have not died to the old self because we don't understand what the message of the cross was. That's why when we have a correct view of the cross, we understand that it means to put to death our sins, to be made alive in Christ, the old self away, the new self put on. We who preach the gospel must not think of ourselves as public relation agents sent to the goodwill of the world. We must not imagine ourselves as being commissioned to make Christ acceptable to big business, the press, the world of sports, or modern entertainment. We are not diplomats. We are prophets in that sense of proclaiming the truth. Our message is not a message of compromise. It is an ultimatum. Die to self so you and I can live eternally. That is the message of the cross. Is that how we view it? No wonder the cheering stopped for so many because we don't like the idea of the biblical cross. We want to be nice. We want to be accepted. We want to be accepted in this world. And so we compromise the message of the cross to be light. And this idea of being like is the insecurity when we were little kids that carries on into adulthood and even to the seniors. Who doesn't like to be like? How many of us have compromised our standards? How many of us have, have lied as kids and as adults simply so that we will be accepted and like? We all do it. And I raise my hand as one who doesn't like to be liked. But then the message of the cross loses its, its power. Which cross are we embracing? The one that saves but is an offense? Or the one that is acceptable but doesn't save? As Vance Hafner writes, so we need men and women of the cross with the message of the cross bearing the mark of the cross. Look at your life. Is the passion you have towards Jesus waning because of what you think about the cross? The third reason why people then and the people now stopped cheering for Jesus was that Jesus advocated for commitment to servanthood, number three. Jesus advocated for a commitment to servanthood. Look with me a few verses down at Mark chapter 10, verses 43 to 45. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's the problem of Christianity today. Christian, the Christianity today we have has turned into a me first, entitlement Christianity Instead of a commitment to servanthood, we ask, what can I get out of my walk with Christ? You ever notice your prayers? Just record your prayers. And what do you pray about? My health, my job, my safety, my protection. 
my education, my honors, my relationship with my parents, my children, my grandchildren, my gra what's, the, what's, what's, what's the common theme? Mine, mine. Again, I'm not condemning you, I do the same thing. Because I hurt, so when I hurt, if I have some physical ailment, my first thing, Lord, help me. Help me, help, help my problems. Because my problems first, because I'm the most important, and the others, we'll talk about it later. Just look at the prayers, and then you tell me if the entitlement me first generation has affected our generation. Oh, this message would be so hard to accept when Jesus says, oh, by the way, as you carry your cross, it's about others. That's why when the first sign of trouble hits, the hardships and the problems come in our Christian walk, we flee far away from it. The talk of commitment to serve others is simply too hard. That's why there are less and less committed Christians in the churches today. It has nothing to do with age. I talk to older pastors, they say, oh, you know what? Back in those days, we had women and men who would serve in the same ministry for 20, 30, 40 years. You don't have that today. They can barely make it through two months. You and I know this to be true. Happens in your church, happens in my church. What happened? What happened to the commitment of five, 10, 15, 20 years? It doesn't happen anymore. You offend me, I'm leaving, all right? Very thin-skinned. That's the problem of today's generation. Now, I'm not saying we should offend people. That's not the point. But the point in is a little hardship, a little hardship somehow throws us away. Heaven forbid that we have to wake up 30 minutes earlier, but I'm glad you're here, so it's not about you. But think about it. The things we volunteer for, the things we minister for, can you come a little early to pray? Can you come a little early to serve? Oh, too hard. You're asking too much, Pastor. I'll show up when it's time. My time. Oh, but for a movie? Hour before, so I don't miss the trailers. So I have enough time to get the popcorn and the drinks. Oh, you can't do that today now, but we'll sneak it in. And we wonder why. We wonder why passion for Jesus is waning in our generation. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us Jesus' message is about a commitment for servanthood, carrying our cross. And sadly, we pastors have fallen into this. We don't preach the message as it's to be presented. We make Christianity easier for this generation to swallow. And so we soft pedal on what the Bible teaches so that we can get more people in our seats so that they will listen to us more. We don't prepare soldiers for Christ in the battlefield, and no wonder when they hit the real world, they are surprised. I remember when I was playing American football back in my high school days in Texas. At the beginning of each season, our coach told us straight up what to expect. Boys, he said, the coach would say, the practices will be tough. The Texas heat will be unbearable and the hits from the opponent will be hard. If you're ready to play, welcome to the team. If you don't want to endure the tough rigors, you can quit. Told it like it is. Not like today, oh, you'll enjoy being on a team. You'll enjoy the camaraderie ship. And then the first hit, ouch, why did this hurt? We, we, if we read the Bible, not at the pastor's words, if we read the Bible for ourselves, especially Jesus' teaching, we realize that he never sugarcoats the life of a Christian. He tells us it will be tough. He says go two by twos so that you have someone to support you when it gets tough. They got the message and they were surprisingly so passionate. That's why so many early Christians did what? Were willing to die for Jesus. Oh, but today, no offense, I've got teenagers. 
one negative comment on social media and we all become emo. We want to give up. They said something bad about me. Oh, if I could speak so as bold, Christians toughen up, toughen up. So that you and I will be able to impact this world because we are in the service of the mighty king. And the mighty king calls us to serve others. There was a story about the great missionary David Livingston. A missionary society wrote to this missionary to Africa and asked David, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know if you found a good road to get to where you are so that we can send more men to join you in the mission work. David Livingston wrote back, if you only have men who will come only if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who are willing to come if there are no roads at all. Did you get that? I want men and women who will come if there are no roads at all. The Savior died for us. He was willing to commit to doing whatever it takes to save us. Are we willing to reciprocate to follow him? It's about the choices we make. Oh, the scriptures are full of verses telling us we cannot serve two masters. You cannot choose two roads. In fact, if you're familiar with a generation past, the great singer, Luciano Pavarotti, he said the greatest advice was from my father because Pavarotti at that time was training to be a musician but also enrolled at a teacher's college so upon graduating from the teacher's college, he asked his father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? Luciano, his father replied, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. If you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. And that is a picture of many Christians today. Trying to straddle two worlds, and what is the Bible tells us, you cannot serve two masters. You can't. It is impossible. You have to choose one. Those who are fully committed to him in serving others by carrying the cross will always have that passion. The cheers will never fade because you've already made a choice. We call them the radical fans, right? If only we can have men and women who are committed to Jesus, especially in this Holy Week as we reflect, the same commitment that I see some of you so committed to the politicians who are running for office in this election cycle that you would go to their rallies and post many social media posts in defense of them, overlooking their faults and the hardships. But that's a different sermon for a different time. The same commitment we have to them, sadly, we don't have to the one who died for us begs the question, who are we committed to? If we were there that day in Jerusalem, I know myself enough to know I would be in those crowds because that's where all the loud yet, that's where all the fun is. And as people shouted Hosanna, I would shout Hosanna. But I would probably be one of them also, if I knew my life, who would wait in passion because the crowds began to thin. And within five days, a same group of men and women would call for the release of the murderer Barabbas and for Jesus to be crucified. Our commitments and our passions are so shallow that they need to be strengthened. And we have this holy week to challenge us to do so. Passions die when Jesus taught that all people are worth loving and saving. Passions die when Jesus talked about the cross and dying. Passions died when Jesus advocated for a commitment to servanthood. But listen carefully. It is for those reasons that you and I are saved. It is for those reasons that you and I should be fully sold out to Jesus 
He loved us, people unworthy. He died for us, people who did not deserve it. He fully committed to us, people who walk away from him constantly. But he never leaves us nor forsakes us. How, when we have been the recipient of these three things, can we not also do the same for him? May it be in your life and my life that forever we shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is a challenge and an arrow even in my heart. Father, may the message of Jesus ring true in our hearts. May this generation never soft pedal the true message of the gospel. It is a tough message. It is a hard message. It is a difficult one to accept. But Lord, we owe it to you because our eternal life, our salvation, our hope, our joy, our purpose, our satisfaction in this life is because of what you did for us. People unloved and unworthy, yet by the grace of God have been saved. May each person's hearts be touched this morning to speak forth and live out truth and proclaim with our lives, Hosanna, Lord Jesus, in the highest. May God bless each one of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.